with a brief appearance in Mighty Ducks. Do you, in fact, remember your line at all? Oh, yeah. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I heard you were a farmer. (laughs) A pillar of the Minnesota North Stars era and cornerstone in American hockey, the iconic Mike Madonna joins us to talk about everything from North Stars hockey to Dallas Stars hockey to Mighty Ducks. Oh, and his current role and takes on the Minnesota Wild too. All of that, plus we're about to enter full hockey heaven with enough tourney action and events to keep your puck appetite full. Let's go. Far Down Beauty's jerseys are back as are a number of other amazing designs found exclusively at sodastick.com. Newly released 1980 scoreboard t-shirts and restocked North Star State logos tossed on that Bar Down Beauties code at checkout for free shipping on all items at sodastick.com. Hello, everybody. We're back, episode 64, and I'm so freaking excited. Mike Madano <laughs> joins us as our guest. I had, when I was a little girl, a little Mike Madano North Stars jersey. Uh, my mom still has it. She won't give it to me. And I'm like, it's mine, but whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't fangirl. I'm very happy to say we did not <laughs> fangirl during the guest segment, but it's one that I would because he is an absolute icon and a legend. Yeah, it was, uh, I told my dad I was having him on, we were having him on as I always do. And we have like big guests. I know my dad will be excited about. He's like, oh, Mike Madonna. Like he was like super pumped. So I, I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, wild fans, North stars fans. If uh, you were around, when a lot the North of stars North stars chatter, yeah. so you guys will really like that. Yeah. It'll be a good one. Yeah. So stay tuned for that in our segment too. Also, don't forget we have our up for debate in segment three. This is all my tease to get you to stick around, enjoy us, listen to the full thing, help us out. Um, (laughs) But we have plenty of other things to talk about too. Let's start with the ESPN NHL deal. And if you guys pop on over to our cues with the Buttes on YouTube, we also cover it a little bit there. Um, But Alexis, instant reaction on the seven-year deal that the NHL and ESPN struck up uh, last week. Um, I think overall, it's probably going to be a good thing. This is one of those things we have to kind of just wait and see. Um, but I love the idea of of new eyes possibly being on the NHL because ESPN hasn't had hockey uh, for years. So I I love that, you know, you don't think of ESPN as a place that that has hockey and, and hockey fans typically aren't uh, tuning into ESPN if you're just a hockey fan. So I love the fact that we might get some new eyes on the NHL, which is typically a, um, you know, they're a gate driven league and, and, and all of that. And so I, I think that this could be a really good thing. And I, I love kind of the way that it's been introduced and all the Stephen A stuff. And it's been kind of fun. Stephen A hopping in yeah. and just saying, <laughs> these are the five things I know about hockey. If you guys haven't seen that, it's great. I mean, it, number it five was release hilarious. the Kraken was my personal favorite. <laughs> um, but yeah, great list of things that he knows about hockey. So yeah, they, they've done some fun things with introducing it and uh, too soon to tell if it's going to be successful or not. Um, but I'm really excited about the possibilities that be on being on ESPN has to offer for the NHL. Right. And I think you brought up the biggest point is that it gets you a new exposure to a new group of fans. And, you mm-hmm. know, we're, we've been clamoring about that for how long, Oh, nobody, no respect for hockey, no love for hockey, yada, yada. Um, you know, and then now you're hearing people complain that it's on ESPN. Well, we can't have it both ways, yep. ladies and gentlemen, we have to do something in order to really expand it. And I think in Stephen A's situation, like little tweet was a perfect yep. example of that. Like it's, you have to know that people aren't going to come into this game knowing everything about mm-hmm. hockey and that's okay. We want to get those fans and help them explain. I think that's a big part of what we want to do at Bar Down Beauties is break yeah. down the game in a way that's friendly and welcoming and, and get down to the, the fans that are maybe just learning about the game too, because they're just as important. Um, so I'm super excited. I find it the most interesting thing too is NHL actually gave up their NHL TV rights, which yeah. is extra money in order for ESPN to take that on. Yeah. Um, so I did find that very peculiar. I mean, I'm sure they got paid very well to do such a thing. Um, but it, uh, that struck me as very interesting for sure. Fred, I do, I do need to say though, that I think ESPN deserves some backlash though, because they have kind of mistreated the way that they cover the NHL. I mean, oh, you go to yeah. the website yeah. and yeah. the NHL isn't even on their top bar. And when they have cuts, what's the first department that always gets cut from ESPN? It's yeah. their hockey writers. I, no, mean, I, I agree with that. Deserve some backlash for how they yeah. have actually treated the sport in their coverage though. But it's also not a top four sport really around the world. I mean, they get more interest from soccer and they kind of had to choose a little bit about where it goes. And unfortunately, I know hockey fans hate to hear that, but it's not. I mean, soccer is a bigger draw. You've got baseball, you've got basketball and you've got football and then you have hockey, right? So, I mean, that's just kind of the way the cookie cookie crumbles there. But I think they're going to bring back, I, I love Steve Levy. 
Um, mm-hmm. He's going to, I think, be back. You have Barry Melrose. I think they have very knowledgeable hockey people, John Bucci-Gross, Linda Cohen, um, that will be a part of the broadcast and hopefully, you know, and they've always kept hockey alive. I feel like those are the yeah. five that I've seen keep hockey really afloat on ESPN as well. So um, I'm excited. I'm, I'm eager to see what they do. Obviously, it's ESPN. At the end of the day, right, you got to be excited about that. It's no longer on a, a versus or on just yeah. kind of a willy-nilly. It's wow, on ESPN. Throwback. <laughs> right? That's, yeah. how, that's the last time I think ESPN <laughs> probably did anything, too, yeah. with, uh, with hockey. So, again, cues of the buttes. We have a couple questions about it that we'll answer and dive into a little bit deeper there. Uh, but let's talk about the Minnesota Wild. Just like the NHL is, speaking of national attention, yep. Minnesota Wild finally getting some, um, you know, because let's start with the two potential Calders. And I'm mm-hmm. going to say Calder with a K because we have Kirill Kaprizov <laughs> Damn and right. Capo Kakinen, um, both two players with outstanding rookie seasons to start. Um, obviously, we've talked at length about Kaprizov. I don't know that mm-hmm. we've really talked too much about Capo Alexos. Yeah, we, we've dove in here and there on goaltending talk, but haven't really honed in on him specifically. And he has just been incredible. And in my uh, Buttes preview that I did for, or maybe it wasn't a preview, but I was talking to somebody about this, about how the back-to-back games against the Coyotes, I thought Dean should have put uh, Kakinen in net for that second game. Nothing against Cam Talbot. Cam Talbot has done a lot of good things for this team so far. But goaltending is such a mental sport, and more than ever, you got to play the hot hand with goaltending. And Kakinen and has just he has looked so comfortable um, and I think they were talking about that on the broadcast the other night for one of the wild games about how he just is so unfazed by everything he looks so comfortable in net. he so makes calm. the big so calm he makes the big plays look easy um, even in big moments no matter what time it is in the game he doesn't have any panic to the way that he moves and the way that he plays and I that you know that moves through throughout the lineup as you from your goaltender all the way up to your forwards when you can have that calmness in net because there's nothing more concerning than when your goalie is panicking because you need stability there. You need them to be comfortable and confident in what they're doing and the rest of the team will follow suit. And I think we've seen a lot of that. And I know a lot of people have been saying, you know, in previous years, uh, the Wild have had goaltenders over time who have collapsed late in games or given up soft goals or made it hard on the team uh, to win games. And Kakinen has not done that. Kakinen has done his job and really given in this Minnesota Wild team a chance every single night that he's in net uh, for them to win games. And so far, they've been doing a lot of that with him in net. So it has been so much fun to watch him because, um, you know, we didn't know what to expect out of him. We saw very minimal uh, game time from him last season. We knew he could play well. He played well when he was up in the NHL last year. But to see him on such a stretch right now has been so fun to watch. Yeah, and I mean, he even called himself boring, but sometimes you want a boring goaltender. <laughs> That's no fine, disrespect just stop to the our, puck. <laughs> yeah, no disrespect to our buddy Alex Daylock or Devin Dubnik, but does he yeah. has this calm presence. He's got this confidence too, which you obviously need. And I think he's made it a very interesting decision each night mm-hmm. for what the Minnesota Wild want to do because, again, it's not that Cam has necessarily played poorly. Right. It's yeah. that Capo has just played so incredibly well. I mean, we're, we're recording this, obviously, ahead of this next series against Arizona, but up until this point, Cam Talbot has allowed 13 goals in his past three starts, mm-hmm. which is significantly less or significantly more, excuse me, than uh, Capo. So it's, it's easy to go to him, especially in the mm-hmm. big games. He got the, the sweep against Vegas. I mean, that's tremendous. And yeah. again, he's getting the help that he needs offensively a lot of nights too. And obviously the defense remains, remains tough, but I think it's really made it interesting. I know Dean Evson said today before the, the game one of Arizona, he had said, we're lucky to have to have to make yeah. those tough decisions, right? Because Good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. Usually, especially last year, we've talked about it at length. Yep. Uh, that wasn't the case. So it's definitely good to know that you've got two solid goaltenders to rely on. Um, and again, moving forward, I think you're going to see maybe more of Capo if he, as he continues to have a hot hand, because you're starting to get into that se- part of the season where you ride the hot yep. hand, right? You keep doing, but you also don't want Cam to get cold. You've got Mm-mm. so many games condensed into a season. You mm-hmm. can't play Capo the entire time. So you've got to get Cam those games too, which I think is why he's getting the start here in game one uh, ahead of this three game series against Arizona. So it's really been fun to watch. Kudos to him. I don't think we have anything else to say about Kaprizov except Holla, Same dollar, as dollar, always. Bill, Kirill. I got my soda stick shirt. I will Me be too. rocking that at some point. We should take pictures today, Alexis. I almost wore it today, but I was like, we're talking to okay, Mike. I don't have it I'm with not me here. It. My dad ordered them for me. So he ordered one and ordered one for me. And he sent me a picture today. Um, and we're going to take a picture together. I'm going to go over there on Sunday for the wild game. And, uh, but he took a picture today and sent it to me. He's like, I don't think I'm ever going to take this off. And then yeah. I was like, we have to take a picture together. Um, when I come over this weekend, he goes, well, my shirt might be a little wrinkly 
likely I plan on sleeping in it. I was like, all right, well, <laughs> I'm very excited about it. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. No, I'm very excited. Fred, did you get one? Oh, come loser. Oh, what a loser. Oh, boo. On, Fred. I don't, I don't ever get name things. Like you guys know my jerseys don't have any names on yeah. them. I'm very against named uniforms or garb because it's like, they're going to leave. They don't stick around. They're going to leave. And this one, I was like, nay, we're going to get this sick ass <laughs> shirt from soda stick. Shout out to Landon and crew. Um, again, don't forget that you can put uh bar down beauties at checkout for free shipping on all purchases. And I believe mm-hmm. there's still some of those shirts available. So kudos to them. Um, kudos to Krill for being Krill and doing his thing, continuing to yep. uh, get on the score sheet, lead rookies, continuing to bring the attention to Minnesota. Again, I want to remind you finally have a player that's worthy, if you will. And I say that with air quotes because the NHL seems to have their favorites of Ovechkin and Crosby yeah. and McDavid. And then that's all fine and well. And it's nice to see Minnesota finally get, getting some of that attention. We've got more hockey to talk to here because we've got NWHL, mm-hmm. Minnesota hockey, youth state tournaments and regions, High school hockey, Frozen Four, plus the NHL trade deadline, all coming up in the span of like the next four weeks. Alexis, are you ready? I am ready. Um, It's so nice to have so much hockey on the schedule because the past year we went so many stretches of time where there was either nothing or hardly anything. And so to see so many things coming up, it feels normal, right? This is what we, even though the timeline of it all might be a little different and the the logistics, uh, we still are getting hockey. Love to see the NWHL announce that they're going to be finishing out the season because I think, and that it's going to be on NBC um, because I think one of the biggest things and one of my biggest things when they announced that the season was being suspended was, okay, well, when are they going to to finish it because we suspended the season last year because of COVID and we never got around to being able to play that game and everything happens this year and so my biggest worry was well are we going to get to finish this season and if so when are we going to be on national television um, and so very happy to see all of that news come out I saw a lot of the players uh, very excited about um, being able to finish the season uh, we got college hockey stuff coming up we've got you know the state tournament uh, for boys and girls hockey high school coming up as well so it's just really exciting that we have so many things uh to look forward to over the next few weeks. Heck yeah. I love to see it. I uh, am very excited. Hudson also is very excited as we can (laughs) all see here. Um, No, I mean, it's great. And you know, you can't ignore the irony of a year ago, everything shut down. You know, I remember we went to the high school state tournament. That was the last hockey game that I saw last hockey game. I was a part of shout out to the Monty Day Zephyrs in case y'all forgot, which I will never let you forget. They won the class. They're not going to forget if you reminded (laughs) them all the time. (laughs) Um, No. So, I mean, it's, it's great that you finally have these events coming back. Uh, In our final news note here, we obviously in the state of Minnesota have dialed back. So fans are now going to be allowed little by little to return uh april 5th it sounds like minnesota wild can have a maximum capacity of 3,000 fans when they kick off their series against the colorado avalanche so that's very exciting um i think the high school league is also working with the state to figure out what kind of access they'll allow for their tournament which is that first weekend of april um so it's all it's moving forward again there's got to be patience you guys got to do it so we have to do it smartly Mm -hmm. um i'm all for that being safe and and putting the health of players and, and people in general first but it'll be nice to get some fans in the seats especially as as we had talked about how well the Minnesota wild are doing right now. It, yeah. it, I want fans to see that there are so many times where I'm like, gosh, I really am lucky that I get to witness this in person because as we talk about with Mike Madonna on our next mm-hmm. segment coming up here, hockey in person, obviously. And as everyone knows is so the much <laughs> real caprice off in yeah. person, you guys so much better. I promise. So um, definitely good. We're excited to see you at the X and uh, hopefully that will uh, all go off without, without a hitch. Yeah, I know there's been certain points throughout the season where I've just been like devastated that there aren't fans in the stands. Like, you know, yeah. Hockey Day Minnesota, Matt Dumba's, you know, point whatever OT goal. Um, I was like, I lost sleep over it. I was like, I can't believe there were not fans watching this. And my dad and I have said it multiple times about Kaprizov, just the fact that like, you know, this season more than ever, fans would have just been packing the stands um, yeah. to come watch this rookie. And so, yeah, nice to see that more fans are going to get to go. Um, hopefully the team of 18,000 is back in full effect us uh, rather sooner than later, but 3000 is a good place to start. Right. And it's funny. We talked to the players because obviously in Vegas and Arizona, there were a couple thousand fans that were present. And that was the first time the Minnesota wild had played in front of fans yet this year. And uh, Ryan Suter, who has turned into a comedian this year, guys, which I know <laughs> is very hard to believe. He is hilarious. He has a joke to throw out. There or some sort of sarcasm every time we talk to him. And I am 
absolutely all in on that. Uh, but he had joked, he was like, we were nervous. Like we haven't played in front of people in so long. He's like, so it was a weird kind of feeling. And then you, you know, you remember it's how you do it, but it has, it's been like a year since they've played in front of people. So yeah. you guys, uh, give it, give it your all at them next time you're at the game and, uh, <laughs> they'll respond appropriately. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We got to find a way to, well, you'll be there. I got to try to find a way to get into these games. I'll be, you got to find a season ticket holder. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to give me their tickets, let me know. Season ticket holders, call Alexis up. She's looking yes. for a way to get into the game. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for our first segment. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Mike Madano. Stay tuned. We want you to help us design the next line of Bardown Beauty's Teespring merchandise. What pod-related bit should we toss on some gear? Stay tuned to our social channels, and in the meantime, continue to shop current lines at Teespring under Bardown Beauties. We're back. Joining us now, I don't even know how to introduce this guest. I'm so excited. I know our audience is so excited. Um, current executive advisor with the Minnesota Wild, but that doesn't quite give it the luster. So I'm going to spruce it up. How about Hall of Famer, Olympian, legend, Magic Mo, Mikey Mo, just Mo, Mr. Hall of Famer himself, <laughs> Mike Madano. How's that for an intro, Mike? It covers it. <laughs> it's good. the tip of the iceberg, I think. I'm sure there were plenty more that I could have added on to those no, uh, accolades. That's you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite nickname? I mean, it, Mo is pretty easy to work with, right? Is there a favorite one you've heard? It's always Mo because everybody really had a hard time pronouncing the name at the start, and the Canadians would announce it different than Americans. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think our my teammates, we obviously, were all – the rest of the 21 people were either Canadian or <laughs> – from Europe, so they had even harder trouble saying it. So it was we we shortened it to Mo, which is kind of uh, kept it uh, that made it easy, and it's it's <laughs> stood the test of time. Those damn Canadians always messing <laughs> things up, right? For everything. <laughs> but how are you? How are things going? Update us on where life has taken you since you've accepted the role as executive advisor back with the Minnesota Wild, which again, you were greeted with such fanfare. Is it kind of surreal to you that Minnesotans really clung on to you from the very beginning and, you know, you come back and it's heck yeah, let's go, Mo. <laughs> I, think it was always, I think there was always a connection. And I just think because of my career starting there, I was so young and, and um, you know, kind of an emotional tie to Minnesota just because of like I said, everything seemed to start there for me and where I got started, met a lot of great people, still have a lot of great friends from those uh, five years I was there. And, um, and they're still friends to this day and are still big hockey fans. They follow the wild. And, you know, there's, so there's a lot of fans that kind of, uh, you know, uh, I would say crossed over to the wild that just love the game that I still see at games that were at the Met Center. So, um, such a strong following and they're just fans in general. So it's, it's, they've always been pretty loyal to their local team there, but um, I've enjoyed it. I've loved being back. Uh, I love my visits there, seeing a lot of familiar people and, and being back where it started for me is exciting. And um, yeah, so, I mean, from Craig Leopold on down, everybody's been so, uh, so great. A lot of fun getting to know everybody in every, all the departments. So it's, it was a lot of, uh, learning as we go and just meeting people and, and getting uh, familiar with how they operate things there. Well, yeah, let's go back to where it started for a second. Uh, your rookie season in 89 hockey and times have changed so much since then. How, what is it like, you know, to have played in that era and now to still be involved in hockey and seeing how hockey has changed over time? Uh, how do you do your job differently seeing how hockey is now compared to when you played? Well, I think, well, socially things have changed, and uh, I think um, I just I just think the overall fact of being such a business and such a corporate entity that you know people it, it, the kind of I don't know how to say this, um, but uh, I think the personalities in the game have changed. I think the uh, you know, the influence of Europeans players that have big impact on changing the game and. Um, expansion in the U.S. has created a lot more U.S. players in the game. So, I mean, uh, the rule changes. I think the game has has created a, a skill set that no one's really ever seen before. So, in that sense, for me, watching the game evolve out out of that clutch and grab and grabbing and you know slowing down and hooking, being able to use your stick as a as a you know 
a defensive mechanism, you know, to this day, you got to skate, move the puck. You got to be able to play without it and, uh, and check without using everything else that you used to do as clutch and grab and, and this and that. So, but it, it's been fun to watch. I love it. I, I think the game has just been uh, at such a high level. Now the skill set of these teenager kids coming in, they're able to get into the game right out of the draft. There's really no, it seems to be really no transition for them as far as speed and skill level because they're doing these things as teenagers that, you know, none of us had really done till maybe in our late twenties. So <laughs> um, it's been, it's been fun to watch. So, but uh, yeah, it's, I would say the speed too is just, it's really, uh, it's really, it's really changed a lot because everybody out there can skate and move at a high, at a high rate. So do you think you could keep up with the guys today? Can you get out there and show them how it's done? I don't know. Maybe a 29-year-old <laughs> could have, but uh, boy, it, it, it caught up to me and changed and, and it passed me by as I was getting closer to the end of my career. Because, I mean, man, when you when you feel you have time on the ice to make a play and all of a sudden it's it's gone in an instant, I was like, I was getting little bits and pieces of signs that it's not as quick and you're not doing things as you used to. And, and, uh, and that was really for me signs of this thing's kind of maybe coming to an end to it. Right. And that's been about 10 years since you announced your retirement. I mean, is that kind of crazy how much time has passed <laughs> and how much time you spent in the national hockey league too? I, I, I thought time would just crawl by after I retired. I was like, what am I going to do? Um, you know, you, you're so structured, your schedule, you know where to be, where to do, how to act, what to say, um, told how to dress, but <laughs> now you're not told any of those things. Like, Wifey's not helping you out with some yeah. of those in those departments? No, I'm on my own on that one. <laughs> now you got to think for yourself. You got to get, get up and create a schedule, some type of, uh, of uh, structure to your life. And, but yeah, I was like, man, I was 22 years of hockey. I mean, I feel like the last 10 were faster than any 10 of uh, the two decades I play. Hands down, it's been just a blink of an eye. Well, and you've got five kids to keep you busy. How is uh, dad life going, especially uh, during the pandemic? I know we talked with players, you know, while they were during the pause and those guys were like, wow, I'm home and I have to see what my wife <laughs> deals with. I mean, what's it like for you to uh, wrangle all five kids, the youngest being seven months? Well, I think that's where I, my life has been uh, I think really separate to anybody who's playing because I feel like I've been quarantined since the twins <laughs> were born. So that's not going on seven years. Yeah. Our, our, our day to day hasn't really changed. Even when the <laughs> pandemic came, we're on lockdown. We don't get out. If we do, it's to the grocery store and, we down and haul it back home um, for the next feeding. So, I mean, Every um, parent just rejoiced, like, yes, I'm like Mike yeah. Madonna in one way. I feel the same way. And then the official pandemic hit and was like, oh, well, you know, our life hasn't really changed. We're still doing the same thing. We're, um, but I think the thing that we've been fortunate, we're in Arizona, so we can still get outside. Um, being in a pandemic and on lockdown in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, I, I would have had a, those would have been some tough, uh, some tough days. Well, you, uh, you mentioned earlier on about, you know, hockey growing and expanding and the European game and all of that. Uh, you were part of that when the North Stars went to Texas, uh, hockey in Texas, coming from a place that embraces it like Minnesota to going to somewhere where it was new to them. Um, what was that like to be a part of something like that, to bring hockey to a new group of people and just that transition from Minnesota hockey to uh, Dallas Stars hockey? And despite the bitterness that still lives in Minnesota <laughs> here, right? We'll be okay with it. We're never, excited about the growth, guys. Don't forget. <laughs> that part will never that part will <laughs> go away. Um, I think that there was simply a lot of shock at the start, but then the, the reality set, of, set in about Texas. We're like, well, I mean, man, if, if we're struggling in Minnesota, how are you going to do it in Texas? I mean, I just we just couldn't wrap, uh, wrap our heads around going to Texas and Dallas and, and trying to create something, uh, a sport and create a, an excitement for a game that no one has seen, no one's watched majority of them. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of media, a lot of hard press, a lot of community stuff we tried to do just to kind of get people, 
on board that this was really happening down there. And, um, you know, so we pushed it pretty hard before that season started in 94, 93, 94. So, but yeah, up until we had that first game, I'm like, I, can't, I just can't believe this just, that actually happened. We actually moved the whole team to Texas <laughs> out of the state of hockey, in Texas. <laughs> I was like, this just doesn't seem uh, uh, a, a, a natural fit. Um, but then it became a real novelty there. I think people were going just because of the, you know, one, we had a very physical, tough mm -hmm. team. So there was obviously lots of hitting, lots of fighting, uh, the speed of the game. I think it kept people's attention. Um, and after being down there for a while, there's a lot of transplants who ended up coming down there in the, from the Midwest in the late eighties and early nineties and, uh, for job reasons or what, whatever. So, um, there was a lot of those people missing the game, but then they kind of really helped us, I guess, grab onto some, a new fan base down there. Um, and then it was just, we're off to the races. I think everybody just loved the sport. It was nonstop. Certainly uh, at that time, technology wasn't as great as it is now. You didn't have the, the effect that they do watching hockey on TV nowadays with the, the quality of the, the picture and HD. Um, so it was, a, it was a hard game to sell on TV at that point. Um, uh, so it was a very in-person sport. So we figured if we can just get people to reunion, see a game in person, they would be hooked. And that was kind of our pitch. So it, it, it ultimately worked. It was a slam dunk there from day one. And, uh, and quite frankly, a lot of fans who first came out that year are still season ticket mm -hmm. holders. So we, we never imagined in a million years that it would have turned out like this. And then that kind of opened up the floodgates for, you know, Anaheim, San Jose, mm -hmm. Nashville, Tampa, Miami, um, you name it. So it, it really, uh, and then back to Phoenix. So it, it, it certainly was a, a door opener for a lot of other organizations. Well, well right, what about, about uh, that. Uh, oh, I was just going to ask quick uh, <laughs> on top of that, you know, when you come back to Minnesota, then for that first game, uh, it's personal for the wild fans and, and the, the new Minnesota wild team. Um, you guys can't find the back of the net in that game. And I, Minnesota wild fans have never forgotten that uh, <laughs> partly because they don't have a Stanley cup to cling on to as well, <laughs> but that game still sticks out just because of, you know, how interesting of a meet a reunion that was and, and kind of how that game went down. What are your feelings as someone coming back and then leaving that game, seeing how it all unfolded uh, what's going through your head in that, in that moment? Yeah, I think it started when it was announced that they were playing or getting a team in St. Paul. I was like, Oh man, this is going <laughs> to be ugly when we go back there. Um, this is going to be a built up aggression for fans and people of that city for this, this return. And, uh, and then the schedule was out. I was like, Oh man, <laughs> I had that date circled. I was like, Oh, this is going to be, this is going to be a tough one. And, and we had a really, uh, we had a good team too. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it was one of those things that was probably fitting that that game <laughs> the way it was just to, um, I think people just were able to come, get out all their emotions in one <laughs> notch. We got killed six nothing, I think it was. Yep. Um, so um, I think our trips back got a little easier after that first one. So <laughs> we, we, we ended up having a pretty good record at XL Center after that. But yeah, yeah it probably uh, unfolded the way it should for the fans, <laughs> the players, everybody who, uh, who held some, uh, like I said, some, uh, some pent up aggression for, <laughs> for, you know, what was it? Seven, eight years after yeah. we left till they got that mm -hmm. game. So I mean, it's still not over. You still see the Norm Green socks shirts oh. roaming around the city, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. Never forget, I, Mike. <laughs> I get it on social media <laughs> and I still, uh, to this day. So there's there's some people who are just it, it hit a nerve. I mean, yeah. Um, there was there's a there's a North Star Nation out there that just lived and died by that team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the colors, the logo, just to, you know, it was a start, 1967. Um, so people, you know, there was a connection there. Like this is, this was our team. This is how it started. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's so much, uh, so much hatred towards <laughs> and, uh, 
and and us players we took the brunt of it because <laughs> yeah. he never made those road trips obviously <laughs> you know um and there was importance to you though in being a member of the stars organization whether that was in dallas or minnesota i mean you had that year where you went back home to michigan to play for the red wings but ultimately you were able to sign the one day deal and retire as an official star why was that so important to you i mean we had miko koivu who recently did that and kind of battled with it i mean what was the importance there for you um yeah, I think it becomes, um, how do you say it? I think it, there's just comes, becomes a connection you have with the community, um, you know, with, in both towns, Minnesota and Dallas, quite frankly. So, I mean, there's, there's familiarity, you're comfortable, you just know the surroundings, you know, the people, you know, your team, you know, everybody in the front office. So it becomes more of like a family feels like, you know, it'd be, it would be hard to leave that family. So I always felt as this time went on, it would be harder and harder to leave. And I signed my last contract in Dallas and it was a five year and I had a lot of interest from Boston and Chicago. Um, so th it kind of came down to the 11th hour, whether or not I was going to go to um, Chicago or stay in Dallas. And, um, and, and our owner, Tom Hicks, kind of got involved and, and tweaked some things to, in order to make that deal not happen. So, um, you know, so I was kind of happy about it, but then, I, you know, then you missed on those glory years in Chicago. <laughs> but, you know, I was like, How fun would that have been with Kane and Taze and all those guys for maybe two or three years. So, um, but yeah, it, it is hard to leave as you get older. Um, you just get so ingrained in everything about that town the state um so it, it became difficult so i i can feel that but yeah going to detroit that was kind of a no-brainer going back to the wings just one year um i loved it there just to see how they operate and and the following the red wings have around the nhl is just amazing so it was really a lot of fun and playing at home fans and friends and family so but uh yeah it meant a lot coming back and then doing the whole signing it for a day and, and kind of make it official. So it, it was a, that was special to kind of do that. Does it make it any easier or harder to retire once you've won a Stanley cup, which you got the chance to do with Dallas? Uh, is it kind of like, okay, I've done it. I can now retire happily, or is it, I've done it once and I want to do it again. Um, talk about that experience of winning the cup and then kind of, you know, ultimately retiring after having that awesome experience. Yeah. And well, it started with the 91 run. So I was like, I was like 20, 20 at that time going on 21. So we went through that run. We're like, I was like, man, this is, this is a lot of fun. I can't wait to do it next year. <laughs> and, I mean, we hadn't come close until, you know, 98 when 97, when we made the coach change from Ganey to Hitchcock. And then that next six years, we just went on a tear and, you know, being 29 and finally winning it, you had a lot more respect for the difficulty it takes to win. Um, you know, so that was, uh, the catch 22. Yeah. You got it. You got your one and done, but you're 29. You still have who knows how many more years are you, but you know, you're not retiring. And then, you know, we, we, we could have won back to back. We still feel we should have, we had a bad start against Jersey in 2000. So, um, we couldn't play catch up, but yeah, it's, 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 um, you know, when you get towards the end, you're very content because you did get one. I mean, we're, it's, it, it makes it really complete. And I think it would, it, it'd been, it would have been hard to walk away without having one. I mean, knowing we did it, there, there is a comfort level there that you're not chasing this thing and chasing your tail because players have known the last three or four years of their career, they're just mm -hmm. chasing this thing and, and trying to get a, a chance to have a, a run at it to win it. And it's hard. Right. And, you know, that obviously continued to solidify hockey in Texas. I know you're a big USA hockey guy. You still hold all these records for American players. But how tremendous is it truly to see the game have grown like it is? You've got guys from like Austin Matthews coming out of Arizona. You've got guys from California now. I mean, it's not just Minnesota producing these hotbeds, right? Not just Boston, Michigan, um, but it's really all over and has really put USA hockey up almost on par with Canada now. Yeah, I, I, well, yeah, the expansion thing helped them. And, and then when kids are able to watch a local team play all the time and they get, uh, you know, they get bit by the hockey bug and they get out there and play and then teams do a great job of making hockey accessible and easy for kids. Um, and then the rinks are built. So you have opportunities to, to get out and skate. So 
Um, I think without those teams there, obviously you, you don't have the impact you do as these American kids have come up. So you're, you're hitting the new demographic, you know, your, your kids are growing up in masses that play hockey. So your odds are that there's going to be a little bit of uh, more skill that comes out of this, these croppings of kids in this different areas of the state. So, and that's kind of really what's happened. We've had a handful of great players come out of Texas and, you know, like you said, Austin Matthews, California, a few from Florida, Nashville that come out. So it's, it's really kind of uh, allowed younger kids to idolize whatever their local team is and, and grow up wanting to play that sport. So it's really helped uh, um, advance the USA hockey game. But yeah, I mean, at this point now, I think it's really, it's almost as level it's ever been obviously for Canada and U S and, and quite frankly, you know, even Russia, Sweden, and Finland. So, you know, those, those five are the, the big powerhouses. I'm glad you brought that up as well. You were going to say what I was going to say. Let's do it. Take it away. Take it away. (laughs) Kirill Kaprizov. Right. I mean, you know, it's funny. We've been talking as members of the media and engaging with fans and there's this constant chatter of have the Minnesota wild really ever had such a dynamic rookie. And you could go back to Marion Gabrick maybe during his, his prime, but also people brought your name up when you were with the Minnesota North stars. Um, What is it? What are your thoughts on Kaprizov? and, And do you think he takes this to another level? Yeah, I, I think the so far, I mean, the, the reality has lived up to the hype. I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, these guys are really high on him. I think it's been a long time waiting for these guys, a couple of years now when he said he first was going to come over. So um, I think with any young player that's coming over, there's, there's a, a sense of excitement, energy that he brings to the team. Um, he makes the older guys uh, – I guess more energized and more like it's playing a game. You know, I I think he has a big impact on old players too, because you realize how much fun the game is to play. And as you get older, you get a little, you know, uh, I guess, what would you say? I guess you get annoyed easily. You get, you know, you have to go through the day-to-day operation. (laughs) There's days that you just don't want to do it and you're not having fun. And I think when you, for Zuccarello, to play with Kaprizov, I mean, that's a, that would be a lot of fun. I mean, I would look forward to going to the rink and playing games because they're, they're really been two guys that really have fed off each other really well. And X been great. I mean, he's just solid. So um, it's, they've been fun to watch. They've been playing with great energy, but Kaprizov, I, I, you know, fans are itching to come and watch him in person. And I, you know, I think he's, he's kind of, risen and lived up to the hype he's been he's been fun to watch he's got a lot of grit and energy to his game and it's I think it's kind of actually flowed into the other guys to say you know we've it's fun being around this kid he's he brings some some energy some excitement it's kind of rubbed off on the guys a little bit it seems like a million dollar smile you can't beat it right he's always (laughs) smiling I swear (laughs) yeah and not knowing English and not talking, it's perfect. You just don't <laughs> listen to Everson every day. It's like he's talking, but you don't understand him. You just go out there and play the game of hockey. There's a language out there that everybody just understands and knows, and you don't have to speak a language to play it. He can say McGolden Light. I saw the latest Minnesota Wild bit. He's able to say McGolden Light, which, <laughs> again, makes him a Minnesotan. We're okay with that. Right. We, uh, we appreciate exactly. that. I mean, you know, you kind of touched on it there, but what are your thoughts about this Minnesota Wild team? Is it different than the ones that you've seen in the past two years since you've been with, uh, with the organization? Yeah, I think it's a, it was a, an, you know, it was an attitude adjustment that's taken place. I think Billy's kind of come in here and, and, set the tone. Dean Everson is like that too. He's like a, he's a no BS guy. He's not going to take any uh, um, liberties on guys, but he's not going to play any favorites either. He's going to play it as it is. He's going to play who's playing well. If someone's off and not doing their thing, he's not going to play them. And, you know, he doesn't feel intimidated. And I think Dean and Billy have that relationship where Billy does have Dean's back. If he does have to make it a hard example, like this Parise thing the other night. So, I mean, that was, probably a group decision and Billy was probably all for it and Dean made the decision. And, and so those type of scenarios and decisions let you know that, Hey, you don't, you, there's a right way that everybody's expected to play. And if you don't do it, you probably won't play. So, um, 
And I think Dean, like anybody, I played with him in Dallas. He's a fun guy. He likes to have fun just as anybody else. But when it's when it's puck time, it's like, you know, let's get serious and let's get uh, a hold of our details and our structure that make us a good team. So, but yeah, they played. I, I mean, it's been fun to watch. They're playing a lot of speed. Kokanen's been playing really well. Um, I think their D's been really solid, just playing real consistent hockey. I mean, they they they're scoring. And I think, uh, you know, they're not afraid to make offensive plays. They're not afraid to try to beat a guy and try to take it to the net, you know, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two just to try to make some space for one another. So it's been, it's been, uh, it's been exciting. It's a, it's a different taste for a wild team because for so many years there was, uh, it was kind of ugly hockey when you knew you were going to play the wild. It was just slow, drag it out. It was very positional. You knew it wasn't going to be a high scoring game. So and you weren't going to get a lot of space out there, um, you know. So this is uh, this is a whole new exciting type of uh, identity they're creating here. Well, and I put this question on my Twitter the other day. I would love your opinion on this too, since we're chatting about it. What do you think is the biggest change that's that's caused the Wild to play like this? Do you think it's the coaching change? Do you think it's Kaprizov goaltending? Um, what is? Do you can you? pinpoint one thing or do you think it's kind of a combo of things that have really elevated this team to kind of exceed expectations this year well it really takes a collective effort to kind of change a perception about a team throughout the league I mean I think there's more structure there's more uh it, it becomes a um I guess uh a real determined type of group you, you've you've changed the culture um you know you you come to to the rink to work and play hard. Um, so I think that's, I think that's implemented from the top. I mean, with Billy and, um, you know, Dean, the coaches, um, their leadership group, the younger players who are hungry, trying to make a career for themselves, trying to make a name for themselves. So they're, you know, they'll do anything they're told or said or how to play. So they're, they're on board. So it's really, um, it was really kind of changing the attitude and the culture and the perception, you know, so now they're, they're a hard team to play with against uh, these games against Vegas lately have been really good, fun to watch. So they're, they're hanging with these top teams in the league right now. And that's probably a great confidence builder for those guys. Shifting gears a little bit. You also solidified yourself as a Minnesotan in Minnesotan's hearts with a brief appearance in mighty ducks. Do you in fact remember your line at all? Oh yeah. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I heard you were a farmer. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Six Beautiful. letters. Six <laughs> words that kind of uh, people know me more from the Mighty Ducks than they know <laughs> me from playing. So even kids that are eight, nine, ten, they still love the movie. They're like, oh, you were, you know, weren't you in Mighty Ducks? And they have no clue that I actually really played. Um, but Mike yeah, Madonna, the actor and hockey player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, you know, so you have a speaking part in a movie, so you do get a SAG card and you become an <laughs> official member of the Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> and it, it, you do start getting residuals. So Basil and I had both speaking parts. And so, you know, when this movie first came out, it was, you know, it was a real kind of a, um, like a cultural kind of thing. Everybody was talking about it, but it really wasn't promoted that well. It kind of came out, you know, obviously before the, the team went to Anaheim and started there. So, um, uh, so we, we, Baz and I got these checks from Disney. We're like, I was like, man, this is, this is like for our residuals for the movies. Like, <laughs> and so we, we would get checks, checks for, you know, I don't know, at the start of this whole deal, we would get them for every two months for, you know, four or five grand or something from signed from Walt Disney. And, um, so I think it just came up on the 25th anniversary, I think. The 20th, yeah, that sounds 20th? right. Mm -hmm. Was it the 20th anniversary or something, maybe? Um, and so, again, there's a big barrage of the game, the, the movie, and it still get played on DirecTV. So, so now the checks have come like maybe once or twice every two years, and they're for <laughs> like 54 bucks or something. <laughs> you know? like that. So it's, it's kind of really diminished a little bit <laughs> that's that's awesome are you going to make an appearance in the tv show you know they're doing a reboot on the tv show have you heard have they called you up yet yeah i have to 
I might have to have my guy. But now the Ducks me. are the bad guy. They're not the good team anymore. They're the bad team. So we'll see what happens. They're like the, the new Iceland. It's Uh-oh. heartbreaking. <laughs> have your kids seen Mighty Ducks? Um, they have seen it. They, I don't think they've sat through the whole thing. Um, my, I guess the, the twins are going on seven. They still don't understand everything that's that I did and what, <laughs> what, what had gone on. And, and so they see pictures lying around or they see some cards that might come in the mail to get signed. So they're looking at these things and they've watched stuff on video and they've watched um, like the, I think the hall of fame stuff on video and, and the Jersey retirement stuff. And um, you know, so I think someone at school mentioned something to the teacher that they were a big fan and, there's times when I take them skating here, someone would come out of the blue and just say, Hey, can I take a, can, can you take a picture with me? So that didn't, they didn't understand that at all. They're like, why do you know that person? Why, why, why do they want to, why do they want a picture? I'm like, Oh, there's just a long time friend. So they don't, they don't get it. That's so funny. You know, of your long lengthy list of accomplishments, is there one that stands out more than the others? Is it being an Olympian? Is it Hall of Fame? Is it the Stanley Cup? I mean, is there, is it, I mean, I'm sure it's impossible to pick, but (laughs) is there something that really sticks out? Even if it's not an accolade, maybe it was a moment in your career that um, you always go back to. Boy, I think there's, there was always a handful of probably great moments. Your first game, you remember the draft, Um, obviously the cup night, um, but I think the Hall of Fame, getting the call that you were going into the Hall of Fame, I think just because it's something you, it's unexpected. You don't think it's going to happen. Um, you're done with your career. And, and, and that time of that three year period before you get to, you know, there's three years after you retire before you're, you're told whether you're in or not or you're not getting in or whatever. So, um, so it was leading up to that third year and I knew it was around mid-July you get the call right after the fourth so I, I kind of knew how that program played out as I got closer to that date so yeah uh, April May and June was really kind of nerve-wracking because I knew my time was coming up so I was like so I was really nervous about it but yeah when, when you get the call from uh, John Davidson and knowing that you're going in that was then you're like man there's, there's nothing that can top it and nothing that would be more complete. And then that was it. So you're at that point, you are totally content with what you've done and you know, your career and you can let it go. Yeah. Where were you when you got the call then on the golf course? I'm guessing because I know that's a big thing. Uh, Almost, but I, I I think I was just at home in Dallas at this time. So we, we were just, uh, we were still living in Texas. So, um, I knew, uh, the days were coming by. I didn't know which day it was. So I was kind of just kind of, being near the phone and then uh i saw 416 come in i was like oh, that's toronto like, that is so um what if it was somebody just playing a prank on you just calling to be like hey just checking in mike what's going on what are you doing today that wouldn't have been cool <laughs> i got uh one final fun question here um the reverse retro uniforms that uh, were released this year someone who wore the north stars jersey and seen what the wild did with the play on the colors and all of that uh what do you think about the wild uh, unis and just in general do you have a favorite reverse ret- retro that uh, was released this year um i loved it I, I i was actually in town in mini when we were kind of going over these jerseys so they were actually presented and the colors were like man those uh, those were <laughs> those look really turned out really well how the play on the colors and still kept the, the logo there. But yeah, it really turned out well. We, we hands down when we saw that with Billy Craig and, and Matt Mako, we were all kind of looking around at that thing. We're like, yeah, that's, that's, that's the one. So that was a, that was an easy decision when we saw those in the office, but then to see them on TV and how they play on the color and the ice, it's uh, you know, it did bring you back to the, the North star jerseys, how, that green and yellow just kind of uh, somehow stands out. So, but uh, as far as the retros, I mean, I think everybody loves the wild ones. I think everybody loves even, uh, I think the Colorado ones that were, mm-hmm. were a big. Uh, those are my favorite. Yeah, those, those, those came across real positive. So I, I think it was between those two so far. Since we're talking jerseys, not to start a controversy for you, but what do you think of the Dallas Stars third unis with the neon green <laughs> we have some opinions on our we have, side we've already what is we, your take yeah. on the uh, electric look if you will 
I know it was the, I think the concept was, was interesting. I mean, they've always done things outside the box in Dallas. They're trying to be creative and, and cutting edge all the time. Uh, I watched the game last night and, uh, um, I mean, it, it showed up okay on TV. I think it was, it was, it was a chance taker on their part. I don't know how, I don't know how well it's been received and, and how well the, the Jersey sales have gone, but it's it certainly, uh, it's talked about. And I think that's part of marketing is just mm -hmm. people talking about it. There you go. So they, that's... They, they got that part down. Yeah. That's, and that's a nice way to put it. I don't care for them very much, but you're right. That's a, a very a nice way. They kind of look like a Mountain Dew bottle to me, if you ask me, but that's just my opinion. Well, perfect. Well, Mike, thank you again so much for taking the time to join us. This was so much fun catching up. Uh, when are you coming back into Minnesota next? I hope when uh, the start of April, I think, because now yes. they've released the uh, fans letting in there about 3,000. Mm -hmm. So I think that might kind of maybe maybe uh, let go a little bit of the, the protocol and restrictions that they're having on people being around there. So I'd, I'd love to be in there for those first couple of games when the fans get in there. So that'd be fun to see. April 5th against Colorado, no better way to uh, to kick things off, especially as you head in to playoff season and things really start ramping up. Well, again, Mike, thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, guys, this is producer Fred. I just want to ask everyone to go out there and spread the word about Bar Down Beauties. Leave us a like, share, thumbs up, review. You name it, we want to hear from you. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, your favorite podcast app. We're back. Thanks again to Mike Madonna for taking the time to join us, become an official Butte. Uh, shout out to Aaron Sickman of the Minnesota Wild for helping coordinate that. Hook it up as uh, Mike is down in Arizona with his family, uh, makes sporadic trips up here. Mm -hmm. Check it off the list, Alexis. Mike Check Madonna, Bar Down Beauties. I get sad because like I, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like, oh my gosh, like it would be so cool to like be doing these in person like we used yeah. to be able to where like we could have pictures because I'm like, yeah, we've interviewed this person. We've interviewed this mm -hmm. person, but it's all over Zoom and I don't have any right. photos to remember any of this. And we're so less cool for it. Yeah. I know because I think about how we were like took that photo in Lou Nanny's basement. I'm like, God, that was so like awesome. And like, yeah. now we just, uh, everything's over zoom. It's just, yeah. Not that but, we could have necessarily done it in person with Mike Madonna anyway, because you know, we could have taken a trip I to Arizona. I wouldn't, but. <laughs> I wouldn't ask to do an interview with him in a closet like we've had to do. Like, we don't have a studio. <laughs> Devin Dubnik, yeah. Yes. Well, times Never were forget. tough. We were, we were adjusting. <laughs> times were tough. But no, thank you to Mike. And again, thank you to Aaron Sickman for helping facilitate yeah. that. That was a very fun time uh, chatting with him and catching up with him. And I look forward to seeing him back at the press box. Uh, let's wrap her up. Our up for debate. We, uh, we went down to Iowa, not literally because I don't care for that Rather state. Not, I will yeah. say it out loud. <laughs> um, but we, we, uh, looked at the AHL team and wanted to discuss some of the prospects that are down there. Dimitri Sokoloff, Callan Addison, or Adam Beckman, who are you kind of most interested? Who are you watching? Alexis? Who, uh, who did you select this week? I went with the easy answer, Addison. Just because now that I've seen him with, you know, a couple games with the Wild, I'm just so excited about, like, what he's going to be able to do in the future. He's averaging uh, just over a point a game um, in the HL right now. I liked what he did with the Wild when he was up for a couple games. Even though he didn't, you know, put any points on the board, um, he did a lot of good things. And keep in mind, he's a defenseman as well. So the fact that he's averaging yeah. a, over a point a game uh, as a defenseman is pretty impressive. And uh, I, I just – I like what he did because I know that they're – we've talked about this a little bit, but there's been talk of like, is he too similar to Matt Dumba? And, you know, he was compared to him so often um, as we've mentioned him over time and seeing him play with the wild, I realized, okay, he's got a lot of his qualities, but he's his own person and he does his own stuff. And I'm very excited to see him long-term with this Minnesota wild team. Um, so that's who I went with just because after seeing him, I, I'm just so excited for more. And you certainly love guys with mustaches. And of little, course, the lip lettuce. Little, How lip could lettuce. I ever go against it? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, no, I kind of went with him too, just because he's the one that we do keep hearing about next, mm -hmm. right? And he is kind of the one that everyone's got their eyes on. They're ready for him to make that next step, ready for him to come on up. Um, for the interest of having conversation, Dmitry Sokolov is another player that I would select as somebody to keep an eye on as well, just because... I've written about him every Minnesota wild training camp, mm -hmm. it feels, and everyone kind of wants to know how he's progressing. Right. And when he's ready to make the next step, I don't believe we've seen him up with the Minnesota wild just yet. Um, he signed in 2018, 19, a three-year contract with them. So I would be curious to see how things are going for him down here. Yeah. Again, I don't have the time 
I, that sounds terrible, but I don't have the time <laughs> to pay as close attention or to really yeah. check in with them as often as, as I do. And I'll try to make a better effort at that. But, um, he's somebody that I am curious to see what happens with him in the future. And if there is a future for him with the big boys. So that was this week's up for debate as always, certainly hit us up with ideas that you may have for an up for debate as we're always looking to keep the conversation <laughs> interesting, uh, since you guys didn't appear to like that one very much. Yeah. About. What's up with that <laughs> fail? <laughs> I thought we've hit some Iowa wild fans somewhere along the way. That's what we get for reaching out. We got to stick to it. We stay in our lane, Jesse. We got to stay in our lane. That's so (laughs) true. That is so, so true. Well, all right. Well, that's going to do it for episode 64. Again, a big thank you to our presenting sponsor, sodastick.com, a stick tap to Kowalski's for also supporting the pod. Thank you to Talk North for continuing to have us on air and allow our voices to shine through everyone's radios, phones, and wherever everyone may be listening. Uh, be sure to check out our Teespring store, check out sodastick.com for Bar Down Beauty's merchandise and other amazing merch. Um, and thank you to Mike Madonna for joining. Thank you to Fred for producing. Thank you to Alexis for hopping on. Thank you for, to me. For to you. Yeah. Just, get, come on. You know. Round of applause for Jesse. Thank you. Yeah my own hype woman. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So no, and thank you to all of you, obviously for listening again, continue to subscribe, rate, share. We love it. We love all the support that we continue to get lots more great stuff coming up. Mike Madonna, just the tip of the iceberg, baby. We got some, (laughs) some stuff, especially as we had mentioned in our first segment, all the events coming up and all of the different things, there's going to be a lot of hockey to talk. So we're excited to keep that rolling. So like subscribe, rate and share check out our YouTube channel. We do still have our soda stick gift card monthly giveaway going on. Please don't forget that. Uh, you could enter to win a $50 soda stick gift card by simply subscribing to our bar down beauties, YouTube channel, uh, winner will be selected at the end of the month. So be sure to check that out. That's going to do it. Have a good one. Hit it, Fred. Near, 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 near.